and I will raise her up, or raise up her waste places, who says to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up. Nothing is too big to overcome for our God in bringing us to salvation. I think the last reference he is going back in history, thinking about the crossing of the Jordan River and the crossing of the Red Sea. Nothing is too big for our God to bring us to where he wants us to be. The sins that we have committed, the gap that we have placed between us and God is not too big. And we need to praise God for what he does. Church. 180. I'll be singing Terrell's list of songs. I didn't have time to use my own. 180. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. How he loves me. How I love him. He is risen. He is coming. Lord, come quickly. Again, we're thankful for this another day that you bless us with. One that we have the opportunity to gather and to sing songs of praises and to hear from your word. Father, we pray that you would continue to be with us as we go through this service and sing these songs of praises to you because you are worthy to be praised. Father, we are 
so thankful for the blessings of this life, especially our family, both physical and spiritual. We pray that you might be with us and that we will receive those blessings that we stand in need of. Father, we are mindful of those that were mentioned this morning that need your helping hand of prayer. And we pray that you would be with them and to be with their doctors and their caretakers and pray that they might treat them in, in order that they might have a new walk in life. Father, we especially pray for Brother Dan Winkler, for Judy Archibald, for Mary Noblin, Sabrina Youssef, if all, as all these will be undergoing surgeries this coming month. And we pray that you might be with the doctors and to, uh, to that they might find the problems and take care of them and pray that, that these individuals will look to you for guidance, for understanding, for strength in this time. And we all wish them a speedy recovery. Father, we also pray for our new president and administration and pray that you might be with them and they might look to you for guidance and understanding and pray that we might get back to a place in this world where we can have peace. Father, we ask you to be with Mike this morning as he brings us the message and brings us to the bread of life and pray that we might receive these things of gladness in our hearts and live them out in our everyday life. Father, we do realize that times we we do err and we pray that you might forgive us to make sense just by in your sight. Con continue to be with us, Father, as we go to this service. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Three hundred and thirty seven. Hallelujah. What a say. Man of sorrows, what a name for the son of God who came ruin sinners to Shame and scoffing rude in my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah! What a savior, guilty, vile, and Sweet, spotless Lamb of God was He, full atonement, can it be, hallelujah, what a Every first day of the week, we gather together around the Lord's Supper to commemorate the death of our Savior on the cross, to remember that sacrifice that he made for us. To help us today to focus on that, we'll be reading from the book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. But when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Would you bow with me as we remember the sacrifice?
Father in heaven, we approach your throne now, mindful of the sacrifice that was made on our behalf, that you sent your son to, to this earth that he could sacrifice his life for us. We know, Father, that he suffered greatly while he was here, that he suffered greatly on that cross. He bore our sins. We pray, Father, that as we partake of this, this bread, which represents his body, that we do so in a manner that's pleasing to you. And Father, we, we thank you for that ultimate sacrifice that your son gave. In his name we pray. Amen. Again, would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you again, remembering that sacrifice, remembering, Father, that your son shed his blood for us. And we know, Father, that it is only through that blood that we can be cleansed of our sins. We ask you, Father, that you would do so, that you would help us, that we may always remember the sacrifice. We thank you for this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. In your son's name, we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. We also are commanded to give that there be no gathering at the last day. This is a convenient time for us to pray for that. There are multiple ways in which people give. Those who are present can put your contribution in the drop box in the, uh, in the back of the auditorium. Others can send it in through the mail or you can use PayPal. Uh, but we're instructed that giving is, is the way that we one of the ways that we worship God. So this time, let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, we know that we are richly blessed as individuals, as a nation. We know, Father, that we have so much more than what we actually need. We thank you, Father, for all the blessings you have given to us. As we return a portion of those blessings now, we pray that you would be with those who oversee the funds, that they can use them wisely, they can do the work which you would have them to do. We thank you again, Father, for all the blessings you've given to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Five hundred seventy-eight. Five seventy-eight. Convenient for you here in the auditorium. You can stand as we sing. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the Great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. Please be seated. For years, Ray had paid no attention to diet or exercise. 
He had eaten what he pleased, never quite found the motivation to go to the gym or walk mornings. He smoked 30 years, three packs a day. He would make jokes about his cancer stick. But it wasn't cancer that got him. It was his heart. At age 52, he lay in the hospital bed, barely able to lift his arm. His enlarged, diseased heart quivered in his chest, pumping barely enough blood to keep him alive. His only hope. When word came that an 18-year-old boy had been launched from the back of a motorcycle, a brain dead, when they were told that the boy's parents had signed the papers and donated his organ, when they learned that he would receive that young, strong heart, Ray and his family wept. Ray would get a second chance at life. And he vowed, this I will do better. The couple lay sleepless in the dark, he on his side of the bed, he on hers. He could hear her crying and his own heart breaking. He wanted to reach out to her to hold her, but he wasn't sure that she would welcome his touch because after 12 years of marriage, he had broken his vows and indulged in a thoughtless and stupid fling with a woman from work. Eventually, the guilt became more than he could bear and he confessed his unfaithful vows. Now they lay there, separated by disappointment, anger, hurt. And it had been this way every night for a month. She crying herself to sleep, he regretting himself wide awake. But tonight, she reaches across the bed to touch him. She draws him close to her and whispers words of forgiveness. Tonight, it's his turn and finally gets it. He's been given a second chance. Before he drifts off, he, he vows. I will be faithful. Mr. Smith came in off the road at the local joint for its breakfast. He wasn't greeted with a smile. Sally, his assigned waitress, was busy, harried, and obviously in a foul mood today. Seeing him come in, she pointed at a booth over there and barked, Go over there and sit down, I'll be with you in a minute. And in a few minutes, she did come over and gruffly took his order, sloshed coffee on the table as she poured his cup, and, but, and all but slung food at him when, <laughs> when her, his order arrived. And she greeted every attempt at civility on his part with curt, rude grumpiness. As he left, Mr. Smith laid a $50 bill on the table as a tip. Sally saw it, and she followed him into the parking lot, waving the bill at him, insisting, you made a mistake, you left. And he turned to her and said, I saw that you were having a really bad day. And I was hoping a big tip would turn things around for you. The money's yours, a gift from me to you. Have a great day. She stood there, stunned at his words. Ashamed with the realization of what he had said and how she had acted, she vowed to take her attitude in hand, and I will do better. If you've been with us for the past six weeks, we've been talking a lot about grace. We've talked about how desperately we need grace. And we've talked about how full of grace our God is. 
our emphasis has been, or at least I've been trying to bring out, that grace, it is a gift from God. It's a gift. Yes, it's intended to save us, but it's a gift that's intended to, to change us. And as we have looked at the stories of grace from the lips of our Savior, we have found that God is, is generous with grace. He is abundantly full of it, and he abundantly pours it out upon us. But he expects that grace will change us. In fact, from the stories of Jesus that we've read, he insists on it. And I don't know about you, but I have concluded in these studies that if, if, if one is not changed by grace, if, if we've only heard the word and it's only something that we, we think about at, at church, if, if, if you are not changed by the abundant grace that God pours into our lives physically and spiritually, then maybe we have not met that grace. Or if you have and are not changed by it. Something terribly wrong in your heart. Looking at these stories, we understand that grace happens all the time. Hospital rooms, bedrooms, restaurants, Undeserving people are in some way given a, a, a new lease on life, a fresh start, a do-over if you please, a bright light at the end of a dark, dark tunnel. I remember when I was a kid, almost drowning in a swimming pool. My parents, I didn't know. I was a young boy, but I wanted to be among the big boys. I wanted to be at the deep end of the pool. I was embarrassed at being at the shallow end of the pool, so I started inching my way down to the deep end. I wasn't going all the way because I didn't want to win. But at least I could get to the part where it looked like I knew what I was doing. So I inched my way in the bottom, unbeknownst to me, because I'd never been to the deep. But it makes sense that it would be this way. The bottom started sloping off. It was a hotel swimming pool, the place where nobody goes anymore. And the reason why is because algae gets on those pools when they're not clean. We won't talk about algae either in the pool. And the algae on the bottom of the pool, on the slope going down to the deep end, was so slick. I mean, I was doing so good as long as my feet were planted, planted firmly on the ground, but it was so slick that even just a gradual slope, I started slipping into the deep end. I can't swim. I'm gulping water. I'm frantically trying to get back to the shallow end. I don't care what anybody thinks of me anymore. And I'm gulping in water, and I'm thinking I'm about to die, and if you can cry underwater, I was crying underwater. Finally, I lurched forward and found some traction and was able to get back to a more sure footing. And that first gasp of air out from under the water, it was the most refreshing gasp of air that I've ever taken in my life. Never have I been more appreciative of just breathing in than I was at that moment. And to me, that's what grace is like. If we truly understand the grace of God, if we truly understand what God has done for us in, in gracing us, it's like a gasp of Fresh air when we had no air. If it's just another religious word that we use in church. If grace is just another 
song that we sing at funerals that maybe you've never understood or appreciated. The desperateness of your situation that God has given. Grace puts a lump in your throat. You understand it. It brings tears to your eyes every time you, you, you think about where you were and what God has, has offered. When grace happens, we're, we're thankful. You think about these three individuals that receive grace from their from their fellow man. We're thankful. We're so very thankful. And while being thankful is, is good, and while think, being thankful and appreciative, I think, is, is necessary, we cannot forget the other necessary part. It must make a difference. If our appreciation doesn't change who we are or how we act, and it's not appreciation. Maybe we've met the grace of God, but we haven't truly appreciated the grace of God. How can I be the same person? If I have stood at the foot of the cross and realized what God has, has done for me, if I have experienced the grace of God, I have not been changed. What does that say about me as a person? Remember Ray? The heart patient. He gets out of the hospital, that new heart beating in his chest. That heart that came at great sacrifice to the giver. We don't want Ray going down to QT and buying a carton of cigarettes, do we? We're offended if we see Ray having received this heart by the grace of that family who, whose son had been sacrificed, that, might, that Ray might have that heart. We we're offended as we see him drive through the McDonald's drive through with a sack of quarter pounders and fries, super sized fries, going home to his remote control and couch. We're offended by that. We expect this second chance he's been given to make a difference in his life. And with the parent of the boy whose life was taken and whose heart now is in Ray's chest, if they had anything to say about it, they would insist that Ray change. Even our physicians and our medical environment say, if you're going to keep living like that, then you're lower on the list. Your name is taken off the top of the list. If you're not going to change, we'll put the heart in somebody who will. What kind of husband would think to himself, when his wife finally forgives him and draws him close. What kind of husband would say, Phew. well, I'm glad I got out of that one. That wasn't so bad, only a month. He begins planning or thinking about his wife. What kind of husband is that? We don't expect Sally to go back into the restaurant, still sullen, still rude, still hope that that you know, fifty dollars on a waitress's salary is a huge chunk of change, and we expect that fifty dollar gift from Mr. Smith to make a difference, not only today but. Maybe the whole week, maybe the whole, hopefully longer than that. Why? Because grace changes people. And we understand that. 
when it comes to a new heart, a forgiving wife, a $50 tip. But we live in the real world, right? Sometimes grace meets with hard-hearted, pig-headed, ungrateful people, and it makes not even the slightest dent. They expect grace. They want grace. They demand grace. But nothing changes. There are some people that grace just bounces off of. It does not affect. But even if we know just a little bit about God, just a little bit about his word, we know that's not the way grace is supposed to be. In an ideal world, it, it, in a world that is as it should be, grace extended and grace appreciated will always be or will always result in a transformation. And that's who Christians are. Christians are people who have understood that God is full of grace and trusting that he will be full of grace for them. They have come to him and he has blessed them. He has bestowed his gift upon them. He has given them salvation. He has graced their lives and they are truly appreciated. And it shows every day of their life. They're changed. We are changed by the grace of God. You remember the story Peter had just was speaking with the Lord. In fact, all the disciples were there. And Peter says to Jesus, after Jesus had given a, a sermon on forgiveness, Peter says to, to Jesus, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times, right? And Peter thought he was being very, very generous. I would forgive my brother seven times. And Jesus said, well, Oh no, Peter. It's not like that. Try 70 times seven. And if you start calculating and doing the math, you still miss the point. And then, as if to say, people who have received a great deal of grace, forgiveness, need to become a people who give a great deal of grace or forgiveness. Peter, do you remember where you were? Do you remember where I found you? Do you remember as you compare who you were to who God is, what I have shown you about the Father, you see how desperately you are in need. And you see how full of grace God is that he has graced you. Now I want you to take that and take it to the world and be that to other people. And he tells a story to help Peter understand this, to help Mike understand this. The story is found in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 23. Let's read. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. 10,000, don't think $10,000. This is 10,000 10, weights of gold, whatever it is, maybe silver, gold, whatever it was. It's, it's an insurmountable debt that he has acquired. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had, that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me. I, I, I will pay you all. No, you won't, you can't. But in his heart, he thinks, I, I, if you just have mercy on me, I will pay you all. And the master of that servant was so moved with compassion, he released him, forgave him the debt. But that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. 
A hundred denarii compared to 10,000 talents. There's no comparison. This is lunch money compared to a debt insurmountable, like the U.S. debt. <laughs> and he laid his hands on him, that is, the one who owed him a hundred denarii, and took him by the throat. Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet, begging him, saying, Have patience with me. I will pay you all. And he would not but went and threw him into the prison till he should pay the debt. So his fellow servants saw what had been done, and they were grieved. And they came and told their master all that had been done. The master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry. And delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if to each of you. From his heart, if each of you from his heart does not forget his brother. I like the way this parable starts out. It begins with a, a picture of generosity, generosity beyond imagination, beyond reality. The people who were hearing the story would think in their minds that would never happen. A man is brought before the king who owes this unimaginable billion dollar debt. Earnings of a thousand lifetimes. He had squandered the money somehow. We don't know what he did. That's not the point of Jesus' story, but he had taken this huge sum of money from the master and squandered it. And I think Jesus is over-exaggerating the situation, the parable, and it's for a reason. And the king calls him into accountability and says, you need to pay me what you owe me. And that's only right. It was a debt that was owed. The man should be willing to pay. He can't. He's gone so far into debt. He, he can't pay. The debt is insurmountable. But he, he is required by law, by society, to pay. But he, he simply cannot, even if he were to sell all that he had, even if all of his wives and children had been sold, he could not pay the debt. And the consequence in the situation was the king, the master said, sell him, sell his wife, sell his children, sell everything he owns. He won't pay it. But at least he'll pay that much. His fate is harsh. But probably no one hearing the parable, based upon what they know about kings and masters and servants and slaves from their daily life and what they've seen, no one is surprised by the ending about what the king said to them. And no one is surprised that the man ends up on his knees begging, pleading because the debt was unimaginable. But I think everyone would be surprised in the reading or in the hearing of the story at what happens next. The king's heart is moved and he responds with, with pity and mercy beyond what we would normally think because this is a billion dollar debt of the king's money that the servant somehow had squandered and the king is, is moved by this moment of this man seeking mercy and forgiveness and the king wipes the slate clean the entire amount now, we know that's not reality, right? The people who heard that story says that would never happen. This guy's in trouble for the rest of his life. And Jesus says, guys, the, the kingdom of heaven is, is like that. You have a debt you cannot pay. Don't we sing that song sometimes? I have a debt I cannot pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. You have a debt you cannot pay. I do, you do, we all do. And God... 
can just wipe the slate clean. No, it doesn't happen in, in, in this world. That's not how this world operates. But in the kingdom of God, that's how it works. In fact, that's exactly what God does for each and every one of us. We have been called into the, the throne room to, to give an account. And we come <coughs> owing a debt. We come having no ability to pay that debt. But it's not money that we owe. We've been blessed with a life to use to display, display the glory of our Creator, the glory of our God. And we squander it. We selfishly chased our own glory, chased our own lust, and we brought reproach upon the glory of our Creator. And one day we'll be called to give an account. And now that day has come. We're in the throne room. We have no reason to expect it, but we all hope for mercy. And wonder of wonders, God take We come to him and he forgives. That's what the Bible calls grace. In the Old Testament, God is described as overflowing with kindness, overflowing with compassion. And when we come to truly understand just how overflowing that is, and we begin to reap the benefits of that overflowing kindness and compassion of God, we are, we are humbled. We are thankful. Oh, thank you, God. And we come together in places like this and we praise God. We sing amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And my chains are broken. I'm set free. And that's what we expect in the throne. Before the, before the throne, the, the throne of grace. And we want the parable to, to stop right there. We, we don't want to leave the throne. We want to stay right there with God and his forgiving nature and him giving to us. We want to stay right there with the benefits of grace pouring into our lives. And, and we don't want to think about what comes next. We want this gift without bothering with the implications. But we can't stop it. Jesus does not. The story does not. We can. In the story, the servant goes about his life, and by chance, I guess, according to the story, he comes upon a fellow servant who owes him lunch money. Pay me what you owe. Poor fellow not. And he begs and pleads for mercy. And the unimaginable happens. The one who had received such abundant grace, the billion dollar debt was wiped. The one who had received such abundant grace forgives nothing. He refuses to show pity. He refuses to show, show compassion. Throw this worthless man into prison until he repays the entire amount. And legally he had that right in that culture. There's nothing absolute, absolutely nothing wrong with him being uh, requiring the debt to be paid. He, he's perfectly justified in demanding that a legitimate debt be paid. This is not a, a debt owned to, owed to a loan shark. This is not some person who's extorting another person. This was a legitimate debt that was owed, could not be paid. You have to pay the debt. Legally speaking, he was justified in what he did. But when you take into account what had just happened to him in the throne room of his master, the master calls him a wicked servant. Not because he did something immorally evil. 
He didn't go out and kill somebody. He didn't go drinking in the bars or whatever. He simply, maybe simply is not a good word to use here. He refused to extend grace to his fellow when such abundant grace had been shown to him. The king in the story expected a transformation to take place. The king in the story thought that the grace I have extended to you should be extended to others by you. And when it did not, the master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked son, I forgave you the debt, all that debt, because you paid. Should you not have compassion upon your fellow servant? Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. For seven weeks now, we have been in the throne room trying to come to some kind of grasp of the depth of the grace of God. And I hope, through my feeble attempts to describe that to you or to re relay these stories of Jesus about grace to you, I hope that somehow you have come to some appreciation of the grace of God. But brothers and sisters, Jesus says you can't stop there. Of the gift, the understanding of the gift. We must express that gift to one another. And the thing I get from this story is that when grace makes no difference in your life, if you receive grace but you don't change, you continue on your merry way just like you were, I got saved, I got religion, and I'm just going to continue to do what I normally do, grace is revoked. Did you see that in the story? That which had been given had been taken away. The billion dollar debt that was taken away had been stuck back on him because he hadn't changed. We know there are going to be people who receive the gift that are going to be unchanged. The heart trend. Some of them are going to go back to the waitress. Is time they just go back in and they're still sour. But we're not like that. We have come to the foot of the cross. We have realized what's been done. What's been done. And we've been changed. We come here to the throne. Before the heavenly host, with the heavenly host, and with all the saints who've gone before, and we worship and praise him for his grace. We sing the song, and we will in just a moment, just as I am, I come to thee. Recognizing that I am a sinner and that you have given your son for me. It's changed my relationship with God. It's taught me how to change my relationship with my fellow man. In so many of the epistles, Peter and Paul and James, they, they tell us what Jesus told them in John chapter 15 and 16 and 17 that I have loved you. And the world will know by your love for one another that you are a part of who I am. And in the context of what we're speaking today, by the grace that you show to one another and to your fellow man, people will come to know the grace of God.
And that's my invitation. That's my encouragement to each one of you and myself this morning that we not only learn of the grace of God from these wonderful stories of love that came from the mouth of our Savior, but that we learn that there is response necessary and a transformation in who we are. And if that's not taking place, Either you have not met the grace of God or you have rejected it. If you see that in your life, the invitation of the bride and spirit is always there. In the book of Revelation, it comes. Come. If you're subject to that invitation, we bid you to do that. Well, we can. The song. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Thank you, Mike. Our Holy Father in heaven, we're thankful for thy grace. We're thankful for this lesson about thy grace and how it is so freely given. And Father, we pray that we will study your word even more to learn what grace does for us and to learn that we don't earn our salvation. But we need also, Father, to learn, and we pray that we will, that even though we don't earn our salvation, we are expected by you to obey your will from the heart that we might receive your salvation. 
preparation for it. Father, we're mindful of those who have lost loved ones. We pray. Especially with the Davisons, be with them in travel, them tough, safe travel. And comfort them in the loss of a loved one. We realize, Father, we have those that are sick and we pray that you will be with them. And give them according to their need. We know that we have a new life in our community, in our church members here in the birth of a beautiful little girl. We pray that you will bless the parents and bless the children. Be with those, Father, that have medical problems. Be with us, Father, as we deal with those that will always look to you and to your word for comfort, consolation. We pray, Father, that as we leave this place, that continue to be faithful, that we will always look at our hearts to make sure that we are being honest with ourselves. And help us, Father, to do what is right. Forgive us when we fail, and bless us when we separate. In Jesus' name we pray.